Chapter 42, Join or Die. In the district command center, the off-duty soldiers and guards began to filter into the HQ from their sleeping quarters. Because of the virus Ashley had used to shut down the comm system, they had no idea the damage she'd caused or the number of their friends she'd killed. The majors who'd fled earlier now returned, wearing their masks, and took stock of the situation. The floor was covered with dead soldiers. Avoiding the blood puddles was difficult. The lack of response from any of the communications channels and the discovery of the missing router forced them to confront the truth of their predicament. There would be no municipal reinforcements, at least not in time. Their Monday arrival had just become too far away. Once they discovered the massacred soldiers on the patio, the remaining young citizens began to panic. Helpless, they watched the monitors, trying to make sense of what had gone wrong and what would happen next. It was clear the facility was up for grabs, Without the ability to control the electronic locks, surviving till Monday would be a miracle. Without centralized command, riots could engulf them in an hour. The young citizens scanned the monitors for any traces of organized orphan activity, while others scanned the footage of Ashley's smoke-filled attack on the room they currently occupied. Down on the athletic fields, Ashley cursed Gray. In her parents' basement, he'd told her he didn't have any idea how to run the stadium camera rigs. The kids broadcast the fights. How hard can it be? Find someone who knows how to do that. That's the easy part. Ashley wasn't a hacker. She had no idea how to patch a feed in and turn on the monitors by remote. Riding her hoverboard, she dropped down onto the third level of the athletic complex in search of her brother and any orphans with technical expertise. Ashley really didn't know the district very well. She'd spent as much time on death row as she had as a free orphan. She wasn't sure where she was, or where to find Jeff and her friends. Sooner or later, she'd have to ask someone for directions. Tonight, the place seemed virtually abandoned. There were no soldiers or orphans to be seen. A few hundred yards from the edge of the level, she saw an entry hatch set into the side of a berm. A few orphans were clustered nearby, smoking cigarettes. This was a post usually manned by soldiers. Ashley stopped the board in front of the Zeros. They stared at her, shocked. Ashley was strapped with weapons, a sword, a rifle, two handguns, and a pack full of grenades. Are you a ghost? One of the kids asked. No, I'm not a ghost, she answered. You're alive? I'm alive. They stared at her a bit more. I'm Miguel. We tried to break you out of jail a couple days ago, but they killed you. They put it on the stream. Yeah, but they didn't kill me, Ashley said. We saw it, a second kid said. Are you sure you're not a ghost? That's Mark, Miguel said, gesturing to the boy. That's Hero, pointed to the quiet orphan standing nearby. Mark smiled and Hero nodded. How come you're wearing a guard's uniform? Mark asked. I'm looking for my brother. Do you know him? Ashley asked. What does he look like? Miguel asked. His name is Jeff, Jeffrey Fox. He's 11. I don't know him, Miguel said. You're really her, Mark asked. Ashley smiled. I really am. Nice board, Mark said. Thanks. How'd you get that rifle? Miguel asked. Mark elbowed him, but he just grinned. Did you kill him? Because, you know, they're not using rubber bullets anymore. They killed a bunch of kids today, over at the elevator banks. Ashley ejected the rifle's magazine. The top round certainly wasn't made of rubber. She looked at it, shocked. You didn't know? Miguel asked. I just got back. She answered, looking up. Back from the dead, Mark laughed. Miguel smiled. We'll help you look for him. Come with us. The three young lookouts led her away, carelessly abandoning their post. Ash drifted along as the boys bounced over the field. The Zeros occasionally threw her sideways glances, followed by nods and grins. Twenty minutes later, Ash entered the rec room where Sky and Jeff sat watching a kung fu movie with the rest of the convalescing members of the Fist. It was late, but they were still awake. Kaz stood with the others in shock. Jeffrey ran to his sister and jumped into her arms. She could sense the Micronics. He had it in his pocket. Drifting away from the lights of the coast, sailing above the black water of the Pacific, the combat engineers hung from the backside of the laboratory wing. They moved at 50 knots, a steady clip for a mid-sized building. The soldiers leaned back into a seated position. They'd been traveling the better part of an hour and would continue for a couple more curving out to the southwest. They would sail out past Long Beach Harbor 
and over the Channel Islands. By dawn, they would be far out into international waters, a three-hour gut-churning and turbulent ride. Corporal Sopressa only threw up once. Keller and Morgenstern returned to the district with Dunkirk's head, only to discover that it had been locked down. The crisis box refused the sedan entry into the district. They attempted to contact Cedric, and found the frequencies jammed or killed. It was strange to come across a locked yet otherwise silent location. Usually, siege procedures were accompanied by a blockade of anchored police forces, emergency units, and a heavy Coast Guard presence, not to mention reporters. Yet the district was still wrapped in deep slumber. They circled to the north and discovered the 7982 Biomech wing had been cut from the facility. Sappers, Morgenstern said. Somewhere, a legislative hearing hadn't gone their way, and the district had been slated for termination. Keller piloted the small craft away from D-13. An hour after finding Jeff, Ashley and friends had sorted out the router and taken control of the internal broadcast network. Every monitor in the district powered up, displaying her half-washed, blood-smeared face. The girl stood alone on an empty stage along a center field sideline. Is it working? She asked someone off camera. It's working, that someone answered. Ashley looked into the camera. Hey, everyone, wake up. Come on, get up. I need you to listen to me. We need to talk. Tell them you're not dead. No, I'm not dead, Ashley smiled, but not for lack of trying. They tried to kill me, but the psychos who run this place, they suck. We can take them. Lethal and Moe, they were tough, but they were Angel City orphans. But the administrators here? The adults? Picking on children? How weak is that? They're punks. We can whip them easy. You know who they are. The psycho governor, her warden, and a couple other crazy fuckers running this place. They tried to torture me and kill me. They even kidnapped a cop. And now I have his gun. Ashley held up Cole's gun for the camera. All over the district, children cheered. Ashley held up her hands. Now listen. I know what we're going to do. We're going to show them, right? They don't run this place. We do. The cheers and roaring applause echoed across the district. Ashley held up Cole's weapon and continued. This is a cop's gun, and it recorded everything. I don't know why they haven't tracked it and come to arrest me. Either this cop doesn't trust his department and hacked his gear, or the department has a live feed and they like what I've been up to. Either way, I'm doing something right, because no one has killed me yet. The cheers, whistles, and floor stomping could be heard, even over the camera. But now hold on. First let me explain this a little bit. They're going to try and kill us. All of us. She gave a hand signal to her crew, and the cameras panned and zoomed out into the night sky. Where? I don't see it, cameraman said. I think it's over... Ashley pointed. Those flashing lights right out there. The monitors displayed a flashing intersection of magnetic cables, the knot pulsing faintly. The residents had seen enough cop shows to recognize a lockbox for what it was. That is a crisis box, Ashley said from off screen. District 13 has been locked down and they're going to sink us. The camera feed came back to her. The whole district is going to be flushed down the gravity well. To survive, we have to work together. She held a wired black box up to the camera. As long as I've got this router, no one's making any calls. So listen up, citizens. This part applies to you. There's nowhere for you to hide. If you run or fight, you're only going to make it harder on yourselves. We're taking your IDs and your car keys. If you don't want a beating, get up to the second level center stadium. And I mean right now. Get dressed and get up here. Because I promise you, if you don't, you'll be sorry. If you make us come looking, you're going to pay for it. You'd better do what you're told. Or whatever happens to you, it'll be your own damn fault. Ashley winked. Kids, doesn't that sound just a little too familiar? They call us Lucky Rabbits, Zeros, and Mitsubishi. I hear them call us that. They think they're insulting us, reminding us that we're orphans. But way back, when the U.S. fought Japan, the kamikaze pilots who flew the Mitsubishi Zeros were legendary and fearless. They sacrificed themselves to cripple the warships. That's samurai. These guards aren't samurai. They wear armor and use guns on kids. They have no honor. They have all the resources, all the money, all the power, and they beat on us for fun. But we have our honor, and we have nothing to lose. And if you fight them with me, by the time the sun sets tomorrow, we will be free. 
We're dead, someone yelled, laughing. Yeah, we're dead, of course, Ashley smiled. But if I die, I swear, I'm taking a whole bunch of them with me. The children's cheers could be heard all over the district. Okay, serious though. Get up, get dressed, get up here. You guys living in the double zero, the old orphanage? Bring whatever you want to keep, because that building is being evacuated. Ashley sent Miguel, Mark, and Hero, and a bunch of other orphans, to her parents' car after the surplus gear. Using her father's expense account, Ash had bought their entire stock of cheap machetes, a hundred butane torches, and two dozen huge spools of trellium camouflage silk, great for reinforcing and concealing field positions. She corralled a group of orphans and had them split the spools of netting into two piles. She gave half the kids machetes and told them how to cut the netting into squares and then cut neck holes, making bullet-resistant ponchos for everyone. The guys at the shop explained that the netting was both stronger and cheaper than the sandbags Gray had suggested. The second group assigned to the garages hung the netting over the open spaces to protect and conceal them from anyone with a high-powered rifle posted outside the crisis box. Within an hour, squads of recently drafted infantry, outfitted with makeshift armor and weapons, stalked the hallways and walkways where citizen soldiers had patrolled the day before. Gangs of armed kids cleared the orphanage of adults, one room at a time. Dozens of citizens had tried to get to their cars. Orphans armed with assault rifles intercepted them. Several adults put up a fight, but no one escaped. On more than one level, entire groups of orphans went mad with bloodlust and moved through the district, killing any adults they encountered. Chapter 43, 5 to 1 By 2.30, the children had corralled over a thousand adults in the stadium, and they were methodically collecting keys. It was one thing Ashley had been explicit about, and it was an easy task to focus on. Now the stage was empty, but for the thin microphone and stand. Ash and her gang of orphaned revolutionaries had yet to return from her second trip to the guards' headquarters. They had set out twenty minutes ago. The orphans in the stands chatted about what all this meant, while the adults, those who came voluntarily, as well as those who did not, were directed onto the field. Loud, boisterous voices came from the side of the stage, where six conference tables had been arranged in two rows of three, creating a giant rectangle. Rival factions had paired themselves opposite each other. Drews and Chris looked dissatisfied with the arrangement. Drews had suggested the conference after the Blades and Dragons almost went to blows. In light of the sensitive conditions, the young lawyer had suggested that it might be productive to sit and discuss a rational, reasonable plan, like gentlemen. Big Chris organized the tables, reasoning that, if nothing else, six feet of tabletop between one group and their enemies was better than air and opportunity. And with the six tables, no factions would have to share. Their natural allegiances were strong. The gangs dominating the athletic complex sat opposite those from the Bolt. Drews and Big Chris sat with Rudy and Taylor representing the Fist. Dante, Yama, and Frost sat opposite for the Devils. Chafusa and Shella, the Dragons, sat across from Hector and Ricarlo of the Blades. Likewise, the Red Stripe Martians and Yellow Jackets glared at each other from their seats. Drews grinned at Chris. For all their bluster, the orphans were working together. It was an uphill battle, but far better than open war. Near the guard's main headquarters, Ashley stood between two groups of pointed weapons. Rifles and handguns were aimed over, around, and through her. Ashley's recently drafted teen army was in a standoff with a group of guards on the outside rooftop adjacent to the zoo. Several dozen soldiers stood before them, blocking their way toward the command center and the armory. They had refused to surrender their weapons. If anyone opened fire, a lot of kids on both sides would die. Still suffering from the shot to his head he'd taken earlier in the week, Kaz rode the hoverboard, doing his best to remain upright. Tanaka, Oddball, Jones, and Rebound followed. Sky and Jeffrey were both armed and walked with them. Everyone who mattered to Ashley was right there. She hadn't been able to keep them away. She hadn't tried. Ashley tried to reason with them. One, you're outnumbered. Two, you have more to lose. They didn't reply. Ash was growing impatient. She needed to get moving if they were going to be ready by noon. Surrender and we'll let you live, I promise. No one moved. Put them down now. The guards still hesitated. 
Ashley slung her rifle over her shoulder and drew the pistol from her belt. She turned, and the crowd of zeros at her back parted for her. The soldiers and the orphans held their weapons on each other, but everyone in the front row was hesitant to begin, aware that they would all die. Ashley returned with a young guard, a prisoner they had disarmed. Only eighteen and small for his age, she dragged him into the open space between the two lines, holding him like a shield. She pointed her handgun at his head. We told this guy we'd let him live, and we did. But if you don't put down your guns, you will kill him. Don't make me go back on my word. I hate that. Put your guns down now. Several of the guards laid their weapons down, raising their hands and stepping away. Yet several more continued to refuse. Ashley's finger tightened on the trigger, cranking the hammer back into a firing position. Her hostage began to shake with fear. A few more guards set their weapons down and backed out, but the front line remained, and there were still too many for such a small space. You won't do it, Michaud said. In his early twenties, he looked far meaner than her hostage. He pointed his weapon at Ashley. I can end this bullshit right here. Ash turned her weapon on him and fired. The bullet struck Michaud in the forehead and splashed brain matter onto the citizens behind him. He fell, his weapon clattering to the cement. No one did anything. Then, as if of a singular mind, the remaining guards set their weapons on the ground. They were corralled with the other surviving prisoners as the orphans collected the abandoned weapons. Every one of them having a loaded weapon, the orphans rushed up the three flights of stairs and secured the command center, killing all inside. Only four kids had been killed, with another six wounded. Ashley found and used Major Dumont's keycard to open the armory. The kids streamed in, creating a chain and emptying the shelves of their contents. It was still dark, the deepest black of the night, when the mortician and colonel returned to the district. This time they were properly prepared. Keller anchored the vehicle just outside the lockbox, above the district's highest point, the dome over the central stadium. They looped ropes through the landing rails and slid giant cases of equipment and gear down through the top of the box. The cases landed safely on the dome and didn't slide. Keller and Morgenstern stepped out together, each sliding from one side of the abandoned vehicle down to the Coliseum rooftop. With the proper tools, a crisis box was no more secure than a doggy door. They unknotted their ropes and pulled them down, setting the transport free. Following its pre-programmed plan, the vehicle sped off toward a safe house across town. An entire layer above the children's impromptu mutiny, Keller and Morgenstern hefted the cases and made their way over to the bull. His eyes still bandaged, the giant had no trouble seeing the cases or picking his way across the rooftop. Keller didn't ask any questions. He'd seen what the girl had done to the giant's eye. He presumed Morgenstern had gone with stereo optics, a good deal better than the singular augmentation, but requiring the sacrifice of his other ocular orb as well. The man had balls of terrellium. The warden stifled the laugh, remembering that, at her trial, Ashley had been charged with blinding another boy. She did have a thing for eyes. Some girls scratch, some go for your balls, some go after your money. Ashley liked to fuck you where you see. Eventually, they reached the decimated HQ, finding the murdered soldiers and ransacked armory. The dead soldiers had been slid to the side, making room for the orphans to carry out the weapons and ammo. There were dozens of bloody footprints, children's footprints, running across the floor. Keller swung open the armory hatch, his good eyes confirming what his mind already knew. The racks were empty. He looked inside the live ammo locker. The shelves were empty. The orphans had taken everything. Together, Morgenstern and Keller scanned the security monitors. All across the district, children brandished assault rifles, handguns, and machetes. The bulk of them were still assembled in the stadium. The resident adults had been taken hostage and were being held on the field. Colonel Keller checked the communications equipment. There was no off-district access. He walked into the main communications room and discovered the missing router. Morgenstern removed Dunkirk's head from its bag and set it on the counter in sight of the security streams. The triumphant orphans returned to the stadium. They drove the captured soldiers and citizens ahead of them, distributing weapons to kids they met along the way. The children could not be dissuaded from kicking and punching the adults as they passed. Neither did they hesitate to shoot those who tried to run or fight back. Several littered the route back to the command center. 
The adults' hands, upon initial capture or entering the stadium, had all been cuffed behind their backs with the heavy-duty flex cuffs Ashley had picked up at the surplus store. Now inside the stadium, Ashley ordered a captive separated into two groups, teachers and social workers on the left, guards and security personnel on the right. Near the stage, the gang leaders sat, hotly debating their imminent future. Ashley walked over to them. The fuck is this? She asked, looking at Big Chris. He'd been one of the first people to speak to her when she'd arrived, but now no one answered. Why are you guys all down here instead of up in the stands with everybody else? What are you doing at separate tables like that? What the fuck do you think you're doing? Drews cleared his throat. Nation building? He choked. Ashley pointed at them and spoke to the crowd in the stands. This is the major problem we have here. Instead of working together, some of you are already fighting over who's going to run what. We're working together, and you need our help, Dante said. Really? Ashley threw the major's key card onto the table in front of him. What do I need your help for? The orphans behind her raised their guns and cheered. The noise was unexpected and deafening. Ashley raised her hand. They calmed down, but only just. Dante showed no fear and stood. We're doing the right thing. The best for everyone. We're going to legitimize the student government. We're here in the spirit of charity and cooperation. He smiled. Ashley came around the tables and put the barrel of her rifle in his ear. If I blew your brains out, how many points would that get me for charity and cooperation? I'd be doing a public service after all. Aware that the threat was hollow unless she pulled the trigger, she lowered the rifle. Fucking asshole, she said, walking toward the stage. Behind the microphone stand, the teen girl looked absurd. Wearing body armor two sizes too big for her, a rifle slung over her shoulder, pistols tucked into her belt, and a sword strapped to her back. She leaned toward the microphone. Orphans of Angel City, my name is Ashley Fox. We need to talk, she said to the packed stadium. The kids cheered and screamed. It took a full minute for them to calm down. Ashley leaned forward again. We have all these adults here who believe that they are obligated to educate us in pain. The shouted hostility for the adults forced her to wait another minute. Once quiet, she looked over to the gang leaders. And another thing, no more zeros fighting zeros. This is our one chance. If we lose today, we're all dead. The truth is, some of us probably won't make it. And if we don't work together, none of us will. We need to become one gang, an army. Are you with me? A tremendous cheer went up from the stands. Okay, wait, now listen. I know you've heard the fucks running this place have been selling orphans, murdering us, and even eating us. It's all true. Ashley held up the detective's weapon. I said I was going to show you the truth, so watch. She popped the slide back and ejected the chambered cartridge. Gage, the young hacker, who'd helped Ashley first get wired up, handed her a cable. She connected it to the weapon's AV port and began scanning through the footage. The stadium monitors switched over to the stream. They fast-forwarded through target practice and cleanings. Once she found the action in the meeting hall, she let the footage roll. The hooded detective was introduced by his kidnapper, Escarito, and beaten with the weapon. The massive screens and speakers broadcast the data stream to the crowd. Every monitor in the district displayed the images. Everyone watched in stunned silence. Keller helped Morgenstern remove the bandages from his face. The forehead over the eye sockets was raw pink tissue, tender. His eyes themselves were shiny, black and faceted, alien optical gemstones. The insect-like eyes were expensive, despite their unnerving appearance. Internally, Morgenstern's vision had been enhanced a thousandfold, granting him awareness and focus over hundreds of spectrums, but on the outside, the eyes looked grotesque. Should get this thing working, Keller gestured to the packs. Morgenstern and Keller knelt and unpacked the weapon system. It consisted of a wheeled mount supporting three riot shields and two machine guns. Built for urban combat, the two-horned beast could splinter anything caught in its path, and it only took a few minutes to assemble. Once finished, the mortician and colonel again scanned the security monitors for a suitable target. The district was either silent or engulfed in anarchy. The central stadium had become a place where madness reigned. Adults awaited justice at the hands of feral children, all in obedience to the blood-splattered ash. 
yet the orphans seemed oddly controlled. They were coordinated and intuitively working together. Keller had never seen soldiers cooperate in such a selfless fashion, even when their lives were on the line. The children saw their enemy with clear eyes. They were unified in courage and desperation. There was no ideal way to attack them all at once, and no way to reach their obvious enemy at the center, Miss Ashley Fox. Keller pointed to a place on the district map. We should attack there. Morgenstern laughed and nodded, his eyes now glittering with broken light. A short time later, the gang leaders and their followers had been won over, properly armed and assigned specific missions. Dante, Yama, and Frost organized the sack of the administration building. Yama and Frost oversaw the removal of the unit's terminals, having them delivered to the school, while Dante searched offices, looking for some hint to the location of the governor's secret offices. Finally, he tracked her to an abandoned wing of the old orphanage. Digging through some old maps, they realized the section was huge. Unsure of what they might be getting into, they assembled a company of a hundred orphans to help them sweep the entire space. Soon they were clustered at a locked stairwell, leading up to the abandoned wing. They tied the caged gate doors to heavy maintenance equipment and pushed it through a newly created gap in a staircase railing. The equipment fell three floors before the grates were jerked from the wall with a terrific snapping and wrenching of metal. The whole mess crashed to the floor below with a reverberating smash. The orphans cautiously moved up the darkened stairwell, rifles at the ready. On the first floor, all they found were a bunch of abandoned rooms, beat-up office equipment, empty desks and filing cabinets. It was the same for three more stories. On the fourth level, they found blood-stained walls and floors, ruined bloody clothing, pajamas, sheets, caked and dried blood everywhere, beds so thick with murder they'd bred entire colonies of insects. The kids pulled up their shirts to cover their noses. They soon came across the first corpse, a child's body, discarded on the floor next to one of the beds. Most of the tissue was gone. The hair lay black and ruined, her face turned away from their flashlights. Over the next 20 minutes, they found 57 bodies. Almost half were missing limbs. Several were chained to their beds. Someone signaled for quiet. They'd heard something up ahead. Terrified of what might be ahead of them, the children held their rifles pointing out and clustered in tight knots. Flashlights bobbed along over the gunner's shoulders. The next floor revealed over a hundred corpses, newer and fresher. Wicked scars crossed their bodies. Many were missing eyes, and some their lips. Some had staples across their foreheads where parts of their brains had been removed. Some still had empty IVs plugged into their ruined arms or legs. Tubes plugged directly into limbless torsos. Horrific as this was, the orphans were shocked by the living children they found. Like the corpses around them, they bore the same mutilations and scars, only they hadn't moved on yet. Their eyes cried out for mercy an end to their torment. Then the orphans met their adult caretakers. The first encountered assistants were immediately riddled with bullets, but the Zeros didn't hesitate to get creative with their revenge. None of the three dozen conspirators left those rooms alive. The images of the sadism perpetrated against the adults were recorded by the adolescent cameramen and broadcast to the stadium. The orphans found the stairwell leading up to the governor's ostentatious living quarters. Dante insisted on going in first, with Yama and Frost. The other kids had no complaints, but followed closely. Dante made them all put their rifles on safe as they crept up the stairs. He did not want to get shot in the back, either by mistake or on purpose. They kicked in the main door to find the bald and plum-stained Governor Mame doing her makeup, unarmed. As they filed in, she attacked, barehanded, all teeth and claws, the children easily subdued her, cuffed and gagged her, according to Ashley's orders. The investigation of her quarters revealed cases of homemade recipe books, journals of gruesome evidence, all composed of her murdered and eaten victims. She kept ID cards, locks of hair, and drops of blood, all sealed and stapled to the facing pages, opposite the description of the dishes she created, and her own reviews of the taste, texture, etc., Dante drove her to the stadium at makeshift spear point, her recipe books accompanying them as evidence. Carved from a hefty tree limb, the spear was planted in the soft earth of the field, 
and the gagged governor maimed secured to it by hands and throat, guarded by machete-wielding children. Soon Dr. Malice joined her, bound to his own spike, where together they faced their captors. Far out across the ocean, Captain Snow spotted the blinking infrared beacon of their anchored transport. The vehicle had parked at its pre-programmed destination and awaited their arrival. The engineers cut their speed, and Captain Snow dialed the lab control room. Inside the wing, the conductor answered and saluted her. He stated that all seals were secure, and that the wing was ready for submersion. Snow gave the official clearance, and the conductor nodded, repeating the order to his subordinates. Snow gave the command, and her team set their elevation controls, detached their cables, and kicked away from the building. As the 7982 wing began its descent, the engineers glided over to their vehicle. The secret project's wing broke water, and a moment later vanished from view. Inside the vehicle, Captain Snow powered up the monitor. The conductor reported that all seals were holding, all dials in the green. Their landing gear had deployed properly and he expected touchdown any moment. Then the wing landed safely on the ocean floor. The conductor saluted and Snow returned the gesture of respect. None of them wanted to go swimming and thankfully they didn't have to. Snow gave the hand gesture to rally up and King engaged the transport's gravity drive. Their flight back would be quicker and considerably less turbulent. Gray and the others sat in silence. He felt as though his guts had been ripped out, shuffled, and randomly stuffed back in, but he couldn't tell if it was just because of the shaky ride or because his father had just had his guts ripped out, completely replaced, and dumped back in, along with a few gallons of that brackish blue syrup. Chapter 44. Free or Dead. Sunday morning, September 25th, 2310. Just before 7 a.m., a team of municipal network administrators alerted the Angel City Police Department to the Blacked Out District. Further investigation revealed the lockbox, preventing local officers from meaningful reconnaissance. Despite the fact that all communication with the district was down, the police picked up the internal broadcast from the stadium. The kids were beaming a real-time feed for anyone who cared to tune in. In typical fashion, as soon as the department dispatched their first patrol, the news crews reported to the scene. By 6 a.m., all the major networks and their local affiliates had massive trucks and transmitters anchored on all sides of the district. They beamed reports of the blackout, intercut with bits of the earlier stories on Ashley, as well as the murdered and now missing district governor and her security chief. They also recorded and amplified the transmission from the stadium in real time. The whole world watched the horrifically violent events unfolding on the district below. Auntie's discovery and the evidence against her, as well as Ashley's experiences at the meeting hall, all openly available to anyone who might be interested. Gage pushed all the signals out through the main dish. In possession of Ashley's stolen router, there was nothing he couldn't do. The stage was awash with heavily armed children. Ashley stood at their center. Cole's handgun lay on the podium, feeding its signal into the monitors. The orphans in the stands watched the recent event from the weapon's point of view. Slick was protesting the locked doors. Escarito raised and pointed the gun at him, but then set it on the chair. The cuffed and blindfolded detective knocked Escarito out, and the gun was forgotten. Morgenstern unveiled Ashley. She took his eye. He choked her unconscious and was shot by Slick. Soon after, Abbott attacked him. The Reverend vomited on Big Texas and Dunkirk, who followed him from the main hall. The orphans cheered as Ashley woke picked up the gun, and shot Nelson. Dunkirk returned in flames, followed by the Reverend who made short work of the Governor and the Texan. He helped Ashley and the teens escape by blowing apart the chains at the front doors. Ashley carried the weapon outside. Keller shot the teens as he and Morgenstern crossed through the main room. Ashley's gun fired at them, but they went into the kitchen, deeper into the meeting hall. The orphans watched as she fled into the alley, where moments later she confronted the murderers, and shot them both. The orphans cheered themselves hoarse as Ashley fled with the weapon. The monitors cut from the handgun back to Gage's main camera. Ash stood behind the podium, very much alive. Her adult hostages crowded onto the field behind her, beaten and broken. She held the gun aloft. The children cheered and applauded with painful enthusiasm. 
They fired their weapons into the air, cracking the luminescent dome overhead. Ashley held up the document Gray had given her only a few hours earlier and raised the microphone to her lips. This was written almost a hundred years ago by one of us right here in this district. During a riot, he escaped and later became a citizen. He even became chief executive. And here's what he had to say about this shithole. Plans for the violent overthrow of District 13. The recently liberated Zeros screamed with unrestrained fury and joy. Ashley waited for them to settle down. Plans for the violent overthrow of District 13 and reformation of the Republic by Dakota Elijah Gray, July 12, 2232. First, the death penalty must be abolished. Until we acknowledge the value of all life, we cannot respect it. Ashley laughed and looked over her shoulder at the captive adults. Should we apply this rule to these retards? The orphans packing the stands booed. Ashley went back to the document. Second, the Republic must declare all people everywhere equal under the law with equal rights. Gated citizenship is slavery by mutual consent, an assault on basic human dignity and the integrity of the individual. All across the globe, Ashley and District 13 had become big news. Her fight with Moe, her execution and the subsequent riots. This was the story of the day, and people watched. On the surface, the district appeared desolate. But watching the broadcast transmitted from inside the stadium, it was obvious things were out of control. The police department, SWAT teams, and National Guard Reserve moved into position, surrounding the district on all sides, and just as importantly, pushing back news outlets and other non-essential personnel. Ashley continued to read, The gates of citizenship are the birth of your conflict, the misery which you spread and inflict upon others. With the gates of citizenship in practice, Surely all men cannot be considered equal. This nation was once the home of liberty, a beacon of hope for all men, founded on the concept that we're all equal under the law. We declare war upon the true thieves and torturers of Angel City, those who profit most, the oppressors of their brothers. You paper men, you lawyers and executives are a weak and cowardly bunch. You think we are worthless and treat us like refuse, but we are the children of men and liberty is our God. We will execute her enemies with her praises on our lips. Ashley set down the rage-filled papers and smiled. I like this old guy. He knew his shit. The orphans exploded into overwhelming applause. As for what I think about all this, Ashley looked at the hostage adults. I think we'd be justified in killing every one of you. The kids in the stands roared with applause and cheers. Several orphans dashed onto the field to attack the helpless adults. They carried batons. A few even had machetes. But that's not what we're going to do, Ashley shouted. The boys didn't stop in their attack. They continued to swing on the unarmed adults. Some were falling, mortally wounded. Ashley screamed, stop, into the microphone, but she was barely heard. Several adults were down now. Ashley held the detective's weapon next to the microphone and fired. The amplified sound was deafening. On the field, the orphans paused in their abuse of the helpless adults. Stop! Go back to your seats, she said. Many of the adults were severely hurt, dying or dead. Most of the boys turned and walked back toward the bleachers. Suddenly, Ash felt deeply ashamed. However, it would simply not do for her to lose her cool here, in front of everyone. She took a deep breath. A couple of the more aggressive orphans remained on the field. We can't just let them go, one yelled back to her. We're not going to she replied. You said they were going to blow us up, another shouted. Listen to me. They are our ticket out of here. Don't lose your head now. Who died and made you God? The first boy asked. Ashley recognized him. He was a devil, one of Dante's crew. She stormed from the stage, her weapon pointed directly at the face of the young devil that dared question her. Swoop and the cameras followed, broadcasting every move and word onto the big screens overhead. Hey, you stupid fuck. I beat Mo. I killed Lethal. That's who died. And who the fuck are you? You wouldn't be here if it weren't for me. Ashley didn't hesitate. Upon reaching the boy, she punched him in the mouth. He dropped his machete and fell backward. She towered over him now. You listen to me now, if you want to survive the next 12 hours, you little asshole. She looked back at the stands and the cameramen surrounding her. That goes for every one of you here. 
Anyone questions my orders? Anyone wants to fight me? Come and face me. One on one. Or five on one. I don't care. But until then, I'm your king. Or general. Or whatever the fuck. Until then, I'm the boss. Just like the old boss, the wounded orphan retorted. Ashley kicked him in the face, knocking him unconscious. I'm willing to discuss anything, if you can be reasonable. But if you threaten me, I will end you. After a moment of silence, the orphans roared. They chanted her name as she returned to the stage. After a brief moment, she allowed herself to smile. The kids in the stands laughed and cheered. The tension was broken. Go! She ordered the gang members still on the field, pointing back at the stadium bleachers. Several adults were kicked as the extra zeros walked from the field. Ashley had already conscripted specific rifle-toting gangs to act as guards for the prisoners. She didn't want extra orphans getting caught in the crossfire if the adults got out of hand. One orphan, as he walked back toward the bleachers, sliced off an adult's ear and threw it at the girl. Ashley was mortified. This was her fault. She had caused all of this. This was not her father like she thought earlier. It certainly was not the fault of the black knife he left her, even if it was an intelligent computer. Ashley realized this was the first time she'd admitted the truth to herself. The Micronics, the prototypes she and Jeffrey now both carried, was intelligent. Ever since it had come into her possession, things had been different. She had been different. Right now, at this moment, watching a boy casually slice an adult's ear off and throw it at her, this was not her father. This was not the device. This was her. This was her own fault, her own doing. Whatever influences she might have had, this would always be her fault. This was what she had created in her own life. Then suddenly, in the same moment, Ashley realized that he, the ear slicer, was responsible for his own actions. She was involved, but she didn't slice the ear off. Same as those on the field arrayed before her, were responsible for their own actions. They had made this necessary. They had tried to kill her. All over the world, people watched. She was rebroadcast on almost every channel. The news channels split the screen, displaying SWAT and National Guard troops moving into position. While on the other half of the screen, Ashley continued her rant. Did you know the law says that if a citizen attacks you, you can only use enough force to defend yourself from his attack? For example, if he threatens you, all you can do legally is yell and run away. She allowed the children a moment to shout their replies. I'm with you. Fuck that. If someone insults me, I break his face. If he tries to punch me, I break his arm. If some asshole comes at me with a weapon, I will put him in the ground. That includes cowardly attacks from a distance or through some scheme like hiring assassins, or soldiers, or cops. First I will kill your soldiers, and then I will come and find you where you live, and I will murder you in your sleep. Ash turned away from the cameras and addressed the prisoners. You are all citizens, correct? No one replied. Many of you have been assigned to this district, as part of your citizenship-mandated public service, correct? Again no one replied. Now who's willing to denounce their citizenship as immoral and demand equality for all people? No one spoke or moved. Let's make it easy for both of us. Uncuff them. Ash gestured to her soldiers for the restrained citizens to be freed. Almost every child carried a blade of some sort or another. She waited as the machete-wielding children freed the hands of their captives. Ashley had almost 1,500 prisoners, but not all of them had been bound. The district census was skewed toward the older end on the orphan side, while the guards and teachers were mostly young adults themselves. Competent orphans outnumbered the citizens better than five to one. Full-grown adults in their thirties were few and far between, and heavily outgunned by the fearless and angry children. It took a good five minutes to sever the bonds, even so grossly outnumbered. Several adults decided this was their chance to make a stand, but none escaped, and only seven were killed were knocked out. Ashley held up the microphone. We're going to give them a choice. The only way we can beat them is if we don't become them. We can beat them with sticks, the ear slicer yelled as he strutted from the field. A large number of orphans laughed at this remark. Even Ashley smiled. It's not what I mean. A smile crept into her voice and the good humor was amplified through the speakers. I do have a plan. 
This statement elicited more cheers and yells from the children. Ash turned and addressed the adults, calmly, rationally. We're going to settle this for once and for all, between us at least. We're going to do it with a vote. Everyone's vote counts, and what you choose over the next few minutes will change your life. The orphans, assembled in the stands, listened attentively, curious. First, the death penalty should be abolished. And second, citizenship should be equal rights for everyone. Two questions, one vote. No one spoke. Raise your left hand if you want to keep things the way they are. Raise your right if you think everyone should be equal under the law. No one moved. Left in the name of the Republic, stay a citizen, try to change things from the inside. Right, renounce citizenship as immoral and declare all men equal. Sounds simple, right? Go ahead. They didn't move. Ashley raised the handgun at the adults. Go on, vote. She pulled the hammer back. It clicked loudly over the speakers. Somebody vote or I'll just start shooting you. They continued to hesitate. I can bring them back out onto the field, Ashley pointed to the stands. The orphans screamed, whistled, and cheered. Ash slowly and dramatically pointed her gun directly into the crowd of teachers and guards. Slowly, the citizens placed their votes. Most of the humanitarians voted for equality, raising their right hands high. But some did vote for citizenship. The soldiers voted for citizenship to a man. Ash instructed the orphan soldiers to separate them by their vote, left and right. A few teachers joined the clustered guards, but no guards on the equality side. Ashley shook her head with disappointment. She gestured for Swoop and the other cameramen to back off while she conferred with Hambone and Oddball. Which medical bay is safest, hardest to get to? The bolts, Hambone answered. Ashley turned to Gage. Can you shut off the monitors there? Sure, easy. Ashley pointed to the assembled instructors. Separate out the nurses and medical staff you think you can trust and take them down there. Take their phones and cut all the cables to the monitors. What? Why? Oddball asked. We will need them to stitch us up if we get away. If? Hambone and Oddball said simultaneously. Ashley smiled. Okay, but why cut the monitors? Hambone asked. Because if they see what I'm going to do up here, I don't think they'll want to help us. Now go. She assigned several platoons of zeros to accompany the teachers who'd voted for equality to God's hotel and informed them that they were being evacuated. Oddball nudged Hambone, and they called over a waiting platoon to lead the good ex-citizens from the stadium. Ashley and the orphans continued with their plans and preparations until Oddball radioed that they were ready. The footage streamed out across the world. Mayor Westbury gave the command to prepare for the attack. SWAT and National Guard moved their saw craft into ready positions, along the outermost edges of the crisis box, but without codes, they could not breach the locked magnetic barrier. Leonard had called every political department the mayor could think of, but no one claimed responsibility for the crisis box. High above the chaos, Captain Snow and her soldiers returned to the district. They activated their invisibility cloaks and stepped from their transport. Using minimal power, they dropped past the surrounding police, National Guard, and news outlets. Snow had specified the old orphanage as their rally point, and the soldiers briefly congregated there. At her command, Captain Gray was sent to double-check his charges. First Sergeant Tarning, King, Splitter, and Sorpresa were assigned to the stadium, while Captain Snow set out to secure the infants and toddlers on God's Hotel. On the screens, on the stadium field, Ashley approached Auntie and Dr. Malice. Agatha Dorchester Mame, Governor of Angel City, District 13. We charge you with cannibalism and crimes against humanity. We hold you responsible for the serial murder of hundreds of children and introduce your personally assembled cookbooks as evidence. Ash turned to Dr. Malice. We also charge the chief surgeon, Dr. Lorenzo Malice, with hundreds of murders by lethal injection. We introduce your cactus statues. Confronted with the evidence before me, I have no choice but to find you both guilty. Oh, wait. How do you plead? Ash didn't wait for their answer. She stepped forward, drawing and swinging the little dragon, slashing Auntie's head clean off in one smooth stroke. A fountain of blood sprayed from the severed stump. Lifeless, the body sagged to the ground, but unsatisfied, as it was still restrained by the spear. Ashley approached the doctor. I plead innocent! I plead innocent! 
he chattered. She slashed again. His head jumped free and his life's blood shot into the air. Your plea will be taken into consideration, she said. The children cheered for all they were worth. Majors Armitage and Watrous had also been arrested. Ashley didn't speak to them at all, but in two more clean strokes, she separated their heads from their necks. Ash lifted Auntie's head onto the stake restraining her dead body. Blood and other cranial fluid ran down the spike as she speared it. The doctors and majors' heads took similar places atop tall splinters of wood or metal. One of Ashley's requests had been for the children to dismantle sections of the old orphanage's gothic fencing. Dozens of pointed metal stakes had been carried in and distributed among the orphans. Finding sharp pointy things had been much less trouble than anyone could have anticipated, and there were at least fifty other adults that had been singled out by the Zeros as having been among the district's worst offenders. Ashley encouraged the orphans to confront the guilty with their crimes in person. Morgenstern and Keller wheeled the dragon across the district without encountering a single zero. The hovering police and news vehicles, however, did see them. A sniper relayed their movements to his superiors and asked for permission to fire, but he was asked to wait for clearance, which never came. Orphans all over the district occupied strategic positions, but the police didn't know anything about it. They'd hung terrellium netting all across the open spaces of the parking garages, concealing their movements. All weapons and riflemen were ordered to remain below the ledge until the police got out past the lockbox. Outside the crisis box, the police department and National Guard awaited orders. They didn't have the access codes and so couldn't move their vehicles through the lockbox if they'd wanted to. Westbury had called in some favors and a group of hackers were working on digitally cracking the box. ACPD SWAT, like Keller and Morgenstern, had begun cabling men down onto the upper wing of the old orphanage. Gray's instructions to Ashley to abandon the old orphanage ensured that it, with its high towers, would be one of the first landing points. It wouldn't be long before they found the governor's torture wards. Almost immediately, the SWAT team was stalled by the discovery of dozens of child corpses. They also rescued dozens of captive children, orphans in desperate need of medical attention, as a result of their time in Governor Mame's captivity. On the monitors, the citizens accused of crimes were brought forward. Ashley asked only that the children accuse the citizen of their crime in public, after which they were free to pronounce any verdict and sentence, to be carried out immediately. The crimes and grievances were graphic and exotic. Rape, torture, all the standard fare, but also accusations of murder and selling children were brought forward on the behalf of absent victims. Several were shot, impaled, burned, and attacked with machetes. Ashley made no objections to loaning out the dragon. The curved ribbon of steel drank from many throats that morning. After the guilty were mercifully dispatched, Ashley again addressed those who had voted for citizenship over equality. This is your second chance. Would you rather be equal or dead? Dozens of right arms went up. Ash again had them separated. She stared at the remaining citizens, those who had twice voted in favor of the gates of citizenship. She gave the signal, and several dozen orphans walked out onto the field surrounding the adults. They were carrying lit torches and machetes. Those who voted with their left arms lost them to steel and fire. The orphans, hard gang members one and all, did not shirk from what Ashley asked them to do. The challenge for these children wasn't whether they could stand the sight of blood, but whether they could get a clean cut. Their challenge was to take the arm in a single stroke. The challenge for the guards was to stomach it without crying, for which they would be beaten and teased. Those carrying the torches showed no aversion in cauterizing the wounds, though many guards screamed during this part of the ritual and lost consciousness. Of the remaining soldiers, less one arm, most were in shock. Almost none were standing. Only a few could stay on their feet. Ashley had lost her taste for the brutality and hoped her point had been made. She signaled for Dante and his men to see to the prisoners, as they had agreed. On the field, Dante and his devils were hardly noticed. Most of the orphans were more interested in staking claims on the too few vehicles and picking out choice spots for fighting off the police. Frost and Yama had objected to guarding the adults, but it was clear that Dante was up to something. Once Ashley left and the remaining Zeros were Dante's loyal soldiers, he stepped over to the corralled citizens. 
She wants to hold you, keep you here. But I've got a better idea. The doors leading under the bleachers were opened and the adults were forced to pick up their severed limbs and roughly escorted from the field to the central freight elevator. From there, they were taken to the lowest level of the complex, the parking structure, under the Iron Fist's campground level. The one-armed ex-citizens were crowded into the parking garage and seated on the floor, behind a makeshift barricade. The relocation of the healthy guards exposed dozens of wounded citizens, lying on the grass, too wounded to travel. Dante walked through the field, executing them with a pistol.